Good morning and welcome into another episode of Mike Up here on Pittsburgh Sports Live, Pittsburgh Sports Now, and all throughout the Now family of networks. This close, we were this close to seeing the first WPIL player play in an NBA Finals game for the first time since 1974 last night as Cam Johnson, who had a stellar game, uh, once again, another double-digit point game for him, hit some big shots, and the Phoenix Suns fell to the Los Angeles Clippers. That series now 3-2. to two. We will maybe even touch on that briefly as we close things up. But before we get there, we are going to talk about a move the Pirates made after an incredible performance by a Pittsburgh Pirate and also touch on what Mason Rudolph's been saying and what the commentary around Mason Rudolph's been and if he has a future as a Pittsburgh Steeler. Because, yes, he's the only one signed until 2022. But with Haskins being there, the opinion now seems that maybe you trade him. An outlet did bring that up. We put it up there on Steelers Now. I'm your host, Mike Osti. That's Mike McCovacan. And of course, Mike Duff is presented by Martin Lawn Services. You can contact Doug Martin at 412-849-5894. And Mike, to get things started, we've been covering this, of course, throughout the offseason on Steelers Now. And Mason Rudolph has been talking and saying all the right things that he wants to be in Pittsburgh. He signed the deal. He is the only one still there at the end of the 2021 season. Everyone else, including Ben, would have to sign a new contract. He is signed. Many thought that once he was offered that deal, that was a vote of confidence. Kevin Colbert has said positive things that it certainly appears the Steelers at least like him as a backup. He did play well last year in the game he appeared in against the Browns. Obviously, the year before had some time, and that was spotty, but that was his first go-around in the NFL. He's improved, for sure. Whether they like him enough to be the guy after Ben is a question mark. Certainly, the fans do not. But I don't think the Steelers would be that mad if he was that guy, at least, to try. They're going to give Dwayne Haskins a shot, though. He's going to have to impress in camp. He has the first-round talent, but certainly other issues. Is Mason Rudolph a part of the Steelers' future? And... Do you buy into now the thought process that because Haskins is there and you can just work on Haskins and focus on Haskins, that Mason Rudolph's improved, but there's a ceiling there, and maybe you even trade him before even the season starts and just be done with him and make Haskins the backup if Ben gets hurt and then let Haskins try when Ben retires or draft someone else? Um, I've never been a I, – I like Mason Rudolph the person. Um, he is a nice guy. Yeah, yeah. I've been around. I, I, I've just never been into the camp that he's an NFL starting quarterback. Um, okay. I, I just don't, I don't see it. I just think, I think he's too slow, uh, both uh, with his feet and his decision making. I think he's a nice backup. I think he's a guy that could be the, uh, the Charlie Batch as far as that guy that you feel comfortable with. Right. If, if things go things go uh, bad, or I think he's proven that. I think some fans yeah. don't think he can. Be those that are val- those are valuable hard. guys in the league the, right. the, today. With the, with you know the amount of injuries, uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I just don't believe Mason Rudolph is a starting quarterback in the NFL. I'll start there. As far as whether or not he's the uh, going to be with the Steelers long term, I don't think anyone knows. Not even Mike Tomlin knows that yet. And I think that that script will be written in Latrobe, or I guess not Latrobe now, but uh, <laughs> over on the south side or at Heinz Field during training camp. It's nice to do mini camp and all that stuff, but uh, or to look well there. But Haskins has a lot of uh, impressing to do both on and off the field. And I yes, I, I think if the Steelers at the end of training camp, if they come to the opinion that Haskins is somebody we can rely on, uh, I, I'd have no problem, and I wouldn't doubt that you know they might look to uh, you know pick instead of cutting him, pick up a draft pick or something for him. I, yeah. I'd, have, I'd have no problem with that. I think that's the smart thing to do. However, they better be. Uh, I don't know. He's that important if you lose anyways, but they, they have to be sold completely on Dwayne Haskins that he is right. uh, a guy that could either be a starter or a serviceable back, a serviceable backup. I think that's the nail on the head, though. 
I think the Steelers would have to be really sold on Dwayne Haskins. Yeah. And while he, he has the talent edge over Mason Rudolph, Mason Rudolph's a third rounder. Dwayne Haskins was a 15th overall pick. People are letting that go. Yes, he's dealt with a lot of things. And yes, he's kind of messed up in many ways, but he has that first round talent. That's why a lot of people love him. I get it. But they'd have to be really sold on him. And I actually disagree with the point that, that you said there that it wouldn't be for the Steelers' perspective, they wouldn't consider it be that awful if they're not 100% sold on Haskins, maybe 90, and then they would trade Mason and, and things go awry. I think the Steelers would think so. I think the Steelers like Mason Rudolph enough that if they're not sold on Haskins as at least a serviceable backup for the future, if not able to win two or three games if he has to come in for Ben, and if not play week one 2022 if Ben – would not be there and be able to win them nine or 10 games. I honestly believe, and I'm not, I don't in any way believe Mason Rudolph is the key is the key to the future is the guy that you give the the football to for 10 years and he's going to make pro bowls. But I think the Steelers think they can win nine games in a season with Mason Rudolph. I, I do. Cause if you look at two years ago when Mason Rudolph was significantly worse, they were only one game out of the playoffs. He started most of those games and it's a different playbook that once they open it up a little bit, he actually played better. Uh, again, he could easily regress. I, I don't believe in him as being a future Hall of Famer by any means, but I think he's proven enough to the Steelers that he could be around and they wouldn't throw throw their fist on the wall. They would try to draft some money if Ben retires, but if that guy's not ready or that guy's not there, Mason would start week one, 2022, unless Haskins impresses. Unless Haskins with his low risk, high reward contract, the fact that he's a first round talent, if he shows them they have that confidence, then go ahead and trade Mason, get something for him. I think Mason's played enough into his value. He'd bring you a sixth round pick, maybe fifth if he really, really has some value out there, seventh at the worst. I think he'd bring that to you. But I think the Steelers feel that if they can't get at least a sixth round pick or if Haskins doesn't impress enough or even if they have concerns about Haskins off the field after camp, I don't know if the Steelers are going to be that upset if they have to hold on to all three of them. Or if they just don't feel comfortable moving Mason, I, I think that he is absolutely a security blanket that if Haskins does not impress enough, I don't think they would be as upset as fans would be if Mason has to be the guy next year. And if he's on the roster, I'd imagine he would have the first crack at playing if yeah. Ben would miss games. Well, the good thing about Haskins is that uh, in a normal situation, um, having three quarterbacks like that, wouldn't be uh, doable within the salary cap. However, sure. because of, because of the uh, team friendly deal that the Steelers have with Haskins, yeah, the, the contract wouldn't even play into it. I, this it's is complete all low risk, risk high reward. There was no reason not to do that. that right, was, exactly. That yeah. So keeping him on the roster that 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 would that 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 the money isn't going to have anything to do with whether or not he's they can keep three guys on the roster. It's whether or not. They feel he has potential. And yeah, if Mason Rudolph is on the roster this year, uh, then he's Ben's backup. There's no question about that. Right. Unless, no, that's that's done. And if, But if they feel Haskins has more potential and is ready, then I could go with, then I could see the scenario that pro football uh, threw out there of, right. because because then it would just be, be awkward. If, yeah, if Bleacher Haskins Report, I believe him, it was. Yeah, if Haskins proves himself in camp, yeah, you know, it, it would just be awkward having both those guys in the quarterback room. Um, I think honestly, if if, if Haskins proves himself, they're not going to do this now at all. They got to no. go to camp. But if Haskins proves himself in camp, the comparable to be for Steeler fans would be a recent scenario that actually also involved Mason Rudolph. We were there covering it back when it was at Latrobe before the pandemic. If people can remember those times, it was when the Steelers had Mason Rudolph and Josh Dobbs. People love Josh Dobbs and Mason Rudolph actually outplayed Josh Dobbs in camp. So what the Steelers do, they traded Josh Dobbs to the Jaguars. Josh Dobbs has since been brought back, obviously. And that's another story and what you do necessarily with him. But that would be a similar situation is you have two guys, because Josh Dobbs is basically just a backup. I don't think they in any way think he's going to be the guy. But Mason, they have some thoughts there. That could be a possibility. He's play I think the Steelers, I will say this is my final thoughts on this. I think Haskins has the talent edge. If Haskins really can impress, I think he has more to prove to the Steelers than Mason. I think this Mason has at least proven to the Steelers they're okay with paying him for a year or two 
and giving him the football a little bit, whereas Haskins has to prove that. So I think Haskins has more to prove. He has the talent edge, but if he proves it, if he plays well enough, they will give him a shot. They probably will move Mason. But if the Steelers have to have Mason on the roster, I don't think they're going to be upset. I do think the Steelers, Kevin Colbert, Mike Tomlin, even Ben, and the rest of the offense, I do feel they think Mason Rudolph's better than fans do. Most fans are just totally done with Mason. We throw up the tweet. We throw up the article. Anything with Mason at all. It could literally be a Pittsburgh Sports Live video that Mason Rudolph says hi to you. And people are just out there. Get rid of him. Why is he there? He's awful. He sucks. I think he's proven he's, he's at least a serviceable backup. He's better than that. He could play week one, 2022, and they wouldn't be upset. And honestly, if you have, if you have Mason, do you win eight or nine games without Ben? And if you have Haskins, how many more games do you win? Haskins, though, has a higher ceiling. I definitely agree if he can impress during camp. The, the, intriguing, the, the intriguing thing uh, with Haskins, obviously, is that I think people have to keep us in mind. Yeah. Who knows what was going on at Ohio State? That's not the most tightly run ship up there as far as yeah. – Or even he Washington. He was allowed to run. He was allowed to do whatever he wanted up there. And then he got drafted just two years ago by a team that before Ron Rivera got there was a mess. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, Washington. Right. So uh, – It is situation. Only been in the league for right. two years. He has been uh, – that's not very – uh, you know, obviously that's not much time. So they're, they're hoping they got something there. Uh, I know my man, Andrew Filipponi is uh, taking a lot of flack for his, I, so I don't know about the pony sometimes. I don't know whether or not he actually believes some of the stuff he says on his tweets or if it's done for, but he's, he's, he's going high on uh, Dwayne Haskins as a Steelers quarterback of the future. And I think that's, that's actually going to be one of the mo- most intriguing uh, things to watch this season and actually will make, exhibition games worth watching a little bit uh yeah with, with who they have in their quarterback especially uh haskins especially if they let it linger to have some fun with mason and haskins both on the roster going into the preseason because maybe they want to see him in some game action and then make a decision who knows um they, they might go that far into this so this could definitely be a conversation for a while before the season if they would move Rudolph, maybe they'd have to do it earlier. Yeah, who knows? We'll see. It's definitely going to be very, very intriguing. Haskins, again, he has the talent edge, and I could see why. Again, Washington a mess. He's dealt with tons of tons of situations that were a mess. He's only a couple of years, and this is why people were surprised when Washington just gave up on the guy because they were upset about some issues off the field and, and different things in the locker room. So first round grade, normally you let that go and you keep giving the guy a chance whether you should or not, so that wasn't the case there. We'll see how long the Steelers – have a rope for Dwayne Haskins, but it's lower risk, high reward. They'd save money. He has more talent. He also, I thought you were going to bring up, he has the arm strength. That's what people are really impressed by. When you get down there, even for OTAs, he has the arm strength, but for him, and we've talked about this before, I think Tomlin in his heart of hearts knows he's more talented than Mason and Mason's good, but he's reached the ceiling, but they need to have Dwayne Haskins prove to them he is hungry. He is motivated. He wants to be a future of a franchise. He will do all the work that's there, and he can handle a gauntlet now of 17 games of doing what they want because that's not yet been proven. So I think he has that to prove more than anything else. To flip things to the other side of the Pittsburgh sports world, from the premier franchise that has an intrigue for trying to win on a regular basis, to the Pittsburgh Pirates going through yet another rebuild, but excitement on Sunday, kind of surprising excitement. I wasn't really even going to watch the game, and then all of a sudden you see what's going on with Max Cranick out of nowhere, called up really, surprised even that morning to those covering the Pirates, it seemed. Five perfect innings, and the funny thing was there was a rain delay that if that game was called, he did enough for that game to count, and he could have had the first ever Major League Baseball debut with a perfect game would have made Bumgarner upset since his no-hitter in seven innings didn't count officially. But five perfect innings, he didn't go back there because it was an hour plus on the delay. That's a fine call for a young kid. Five perfect innings, incredible. And then 24 hours later, honestly, less than 24 hours later, the Pirates kind of popped the balloon of excitement, sending him down for a reliever. I get it, maybe what they needed for their roster, but this isn't a year where they're really going to be able to win no matter what. That was excitement. If they kept him, he would have been around and had his next start doing July 4th weekend. That could have been really exciting after his debut of the five perfect innings. 
Are you upset to see him sent down? Do you understand it? Or does that pop the balloon in excitement a little bit for a holiday weekend? Should have they should they have kept him up to see what they had for a few starts at least, even though it was a surprise because it is a young talent pitcher and obviously they need those. No, I'm not upset just because I, I this has been done uh, maybe not in this exact situation as far as a no hitter goes, but this is just basically a paper move. Um, yeah. Your bullpen was thin in Colorado uh, guys that were used. They know that's a place that, um, you know, you're going to use a lot of pitchers probably uh, unless your starter goes well, which doesn't happen a lot there, but um no, he'll be back. Uh, I, I, I understand. I understand the optics of it doesn't look good. Don't look good. Right. But Max Cranach will be back. Uh, he'll be back before the end of July. Um, and, you know, I, if you read some of the uh, comments that Shelton threw out, he could be back just because of a trade as far as, you know. Oh, come, yeah. They're going to need players at that yeah, point. Exactly. They're going to ship several off. That's line. clear. Yeah, we're coming up to the trade deadline. Uh, the Pirates are obviously going to be active or should be active uh, before yeah. July. Right. So these guys are going to get their opportunity. We, we haven't seen the last, last of him. Uh, he'll be here. Wouldn't it have been nice to have him, you know, uh, try to go out there again and see, long, see how long he can go? Yes. But in the long term, I don't know that it's that big. It, to me, the, bigger, the biggest story is the fact that they might have another guy uh, I believe he got drafted in the same year that uh, Brubaker did, 2016. Who, who knows? Uh, you know, I don't want to get too excited on him. It's one start, but uh, you know, it would be nice for them if they're able to start pulling some of these guys from their own system that they drafted, and they start turning into something. Uh, he'll have uh, July, August, and September of three months to. You know, show with the pirates, uh, show the pirates brass what he has, and uh, hopefully, it's a good story. And for the pirates, they need to hope that he can be that that stud pitcher because, yeah, they kind of have been surprised by Brubeck or even Tyler Anderson this year. Granted, maybe we'll see what they do in the draft if they have another one that seems to be a guaranteed stud coming up. Lighter finishes his career at, at Vanderbilt. Threw a solid outing, won the game. Vanderbilt now uh, a win away from a national title. So we'll see about the future of the Pirates, if he's going to be there and he can kind of bolster that staff for the future. They do have some guys that came up this year. Uh, I wanted to just throw out one thing, and I know this will be very unpopular. And trust me, I am not. I'm excited then. I wasn't a fan. I'm not a fan of Neil Huntington. I'll just say this, though. Everything the guy – the problem with when a guy gets fired at the end is everybody, you know, you remember all the bad things and uh, you know, everyone, everyone's looked at us as, as a dunce and a complete failure. But just remember <laughs> that uh, while he did plenty, 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 plenty of bad things, he was the guy also responsible for drafting key Brian Hayes. He was also the guy that, um, uh, traded Andrew McCutcheon and they got Brian Reynolds for that was a good trade. I, yes. yes he got sure. Brian Reynolds one trade he cannot risk for trading the face of the face of the franchise, but that right. deal looks, that deal looks like pretty, uh, pretty good deal for the pirates. Right. And then, you know, JT Brubaker and this guy were also part of his draft thing. So I'm not, uh, this is not trying to rewrite history and say that Neil Huntington was a GM, but yeah, I just he's still touching say, the positive of the team. Yeah. I just want to say that he wasn't a complete uh, dunce. One other thing, Mike, Hector Santiago, does the name. Anything? Does it ring a bell? Is that. Yeah. <laughs> are we, last, are we, our yeah. last show we talked about, there will yeah, be happened. some more. Yeah, there will yeah. be some moron that gets suspended for the, yeah, the Mariners that uh, MLB crackdown illegal substance. Yeah, Hector Santiago of the Mar. I, I, I had to keep this screenshot just so we could bring this up. Uh, yeah. Ejected uh, within the uh, Seattle Chicago White Sox game for being the first guy that got uh, dumb enough to get busted for the illegal substance. Congratulations, yeah. Hector. 
Yeah, that's the name you're going to remember. That's the trivia question for any of those shows out there in the future. If you're a Chase fan or anything like that, Hector Santiago of the Seattle Mariners, yeah, he's going to be more known for this than anything else he's done on the baseball diamond at this point. They put <laughs> they put it in, uh, it looked like a kitchen garbage bag. Yeah, I, saw I think it. they just bought it the day, the day earlier at, at a Kogo's. Uh, yeah, that was a fiasco. Of course, somebody was going to be, honestly, because it was in the Pacific Northwest, maybe, and it was just a random picture, it hasn't necessarily caught the fire that I would have thought it caught. People were just right. like, okay, we knew it was going to happen. He's an idiot. He'll be out for a while. Let's move on. It hasn't been as impactful as I thought it would be. But, yeah, it did occur that it's kind of funny. The Pirates maybe have another young young stud based on what we saw. That was a surprise. I don't think anyone predicted that for Granite. Five per inning to start things off. And, of course, your major league debut does not guarantee you're going to keep that up. He could easily suck in his second outing. I think the only thing, the only devil's advocate opinion I have on this is it does kind of suck just because, yeah, he's going to be back, but holiday weekend, there would have been excitement and buzz around the Pirates if July 4th is Cranick's second career start after five perfect innings. Now there will be no buzz on that, around that game or on, on that team. That might even have brought fans to that ballpark. That's the other thought, that if you cared at all about that for the Pirate franchise, you let him go one more start at least, Yes, he'll see action when they make trades, but you know that anyway. Maybe you let him go one more start if he's horrible. Then you set him down a bit of confidence. It's only, Maybe he won't even have his confidence blown because it's just one start. You can't gauge much off one or two starts. But going into that outing, that would have brought excitement that otherwise is not there. And, Mike, as we close up shop, we don't have an NBA team that we're covering, so we don't talk NBA tons, but we're able to now because we have a WPIL product who is a game away, a win away from appearing in the NBA Finals. And as I said at the top of the show, this would be the first time a WPL product has appeared in an NBA Finals game since 1974. Cam Johnson, a solid outing again, a spark plug off the bench for the Suns, not a deep bench, so he's getting his time, he's getting his shots. And the Suns basically kind of got run off the gym. They came back a little bit. They did play that tough. I thought the Clippers were going to blow it again, honestly, for a while because Paul George has just been Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde. He ends up, though, with an incredible outing offensively with 40-plus points, and the Clippers do win. Phoenix still a 3-2 lead in this series. We're going to back, night. Mike. You're, you're our NBA guy here. Yeah. Can, uh, can the Clippers do it again? And I, I thought you had a great tweet uh, either last night or this morning um, about uh, Ty Lue and the respect he's going to gain, he's yeah. going to get more respect yeah. for having his team battle and play hard than when he won with LeBron, where it was probably just considered, yeah. you know, he won because of LeBron. Right. And that was almost a play off the tweet that was thrown out there weeks ago after Kevin Durant earned more respect for losing a game seven as well as he played than winning those two NBA finals MVPs because of the team he jumped on. Yeah. <laughs> Ty Lue has gained a lot of respect through this run. Even if the Clippers don't do it, you have to think of it this way. Imagine if Kawhi Leonard was there. Yeah. I'm pulling for Cam Johnson, but I'll tell you right now, based on how this series has rolled out, I'll say this. If Kawhi Leonard was there, Clippers win this series. The Phoenix Suns have looked like the better team throughout most of this series, but the Clippers did get a screwed on, did get screwed in a couple calls. Imagine if Paul George would have hit those free throws in game two. You wouldn't have got the value. The Clippers would have had enough of a lead that that would have only tied things or they would have had to draw something else up. They would have had to look for a three-pointer. That would have been more risky and probably not go. Then the Clippers win that game. You could even point to maybe the basketball went off Payne's fingers, the backup for CP3 and not a Clipper. That would have then been Clippers ball at the end of game four. And that would have gave them a shot at the end of that game as poorly as they played all the way throughout and as bad as that game overall was for both teams offensively. So the Clippers have had their time. They've kind of got screwed a little bit. They've been under man with Kawhi out. The Suns are now full head of steam with now CP3 back, even though he's struggling. I do think the Suns are eventually going to win this series now. I think it's too tough to do it three in a row. I know the Clippers have done it before. But without Kawhi Leonard, because when they did it before in these playoffs, they had Kawhi Leonard. They had those two stars. He's the better player than Paul George. I don't know if I can buy into Paul George doing what he did in game five, in game six, and in game seven. Game seven would be in Phoenix, even though obviously the Clippers have won on the road in Phoenix. I think Phoenix is still going to win this series. They have the edge of having to just win one where the Clippers have to win two. But I will tell you that – 
Phoenix made the same mistake everybody else made. I mean, the Clippers are a good team. They Reggie Jackson company and man, I mean, they have shooters. They have maybe a deeper overall team, even though the Suns have more star power and more better players right now, better players on that top five. So I wouldn't be shell shocked. You, I thought the Suns were going to win last night and do and just end it because I thought the Clippers yeah. were just demoralized after the game before. Maybe it was the end of the road for them. No one would have been mad with what they had to deal with this year, but. If the Clippers pull this off, I will say this, and this goes back to Ty Lue. This is crazy to say it because he is still a young coach. There are still plenty of years to go. I get, I'm, I'm not a prisoner of the moment, and I love contextually things historically, and he got to do it over years and years to get this respect. If you have Ty Lue, who has already led a team to three finals, he's won a championship. The championship he won was a 50-year city drought. Yes, LeBron was there, but they did it to beat a team that had other stars as well. People forget that was a stacked Warriors team as well. So it wasn't like it was just LeBron against, against Kraft. And then you take the Clippers who already, this is impressive, which is why he's getting respect deep into a series, if not to their first ever NBA final, this is already their first ever Western conference finals of franchise history. When doc rivers was there for years with Chris Paul being there, Blake Griffin in his prime, they couldn't get even to this point. If he would get them to the NBA finals, I think, Ty Lue, how do you keep him out of the Hall of Fame at this point? What he did as a player, winning all those rings, even though he was was a backup player with the Lakers, and then now as a coach, four finals and and one ring already with with the curse-breaking Cavs, and then if he would somehow do it with the Clippers that have never been near this, it may be the worst professional sports team in history, wow. He is he is going to almost need to go to management and say, I need a new contract. This is just incredible what he's doing. Mm -hmm. Really impressive. I don't see how you would not be able to somehow honor that in some Hall of Fame, no matter what he does the rest of his career, based on just curse-breaking mentality around him. And I think why, if you listen to his his interviews, he is just so – have you ever even seen a guy so calm, cool, and collected? No. He's just sitting there saying, why not? So, I, easily. Why would we not be able to do it? I, I don't know. I've done it before. We've done it before. We've done it before. No big deal. It's like, it's a pretty hard thing to do. <laughs> I don't know. I think the odds are against you, but he just sits there, just brushes shoulders off. Yeah, I know. Paul George, he's great. I'm not surprised. Okay. Like he just, I mean, obviously yeah, he might a, think different, different things, but he he's really a is. Type of, he's a different yeah. type of athlete as far yeah. as his uh, uh, public demeanor. Who, who knows what, how he is in the locker room. And right. And he may think court, different things. He's just, but... a, he's just a reserved, yeah, chill type of guy that uh, is very different than, you know, 95% of, you know, today's professional athletes. Yeah. And maybe they love, maybe that's why they're trying, even though they know they're outnumbered because they got to really love playing for him. He really feels confidence in them. He is really just that calm, cool, collected guy, Richard Jefferson, one of those Cavs players in that 16 team just raised and how cool and collected he even was then against the Warriors down three run with the weight of the world on their shoulders. So prop to Ty Lue, no matter what happens, it would be really cool to see Cam Johnson in the NBA finals. Again, that'd be the first Whitfield player since 1974. Of course, Chris Paul has played more minutes, more all-star appearances, scored more points in a career in the postseason, And really a lot of it in the regular season, one of those hall of fame players that has never played in NBA finals, only his second Western conference finals. And that was against a stack warriors team. So that would be cool for him as well, but uh, I, they let the Clippers win game six. I think they got a problem. I think they then got a problem. And it's kind of funny too, with how Kawhi Leonard's acted the last few years. If yes, his, his title with the Raptors was almost all him, but they would do this without him after he wanted to get there for years and be the guy that did it there. They would do it without him. That would earn Paul George, the bag, um, that would earn Reggie Jackson the bag, who needs a new contract. And, uh, yeah, Ty Lu, it just, it's just incredible. They call him Belichick. That's what they're literally calling him for adjustments. It looks like a different team in the second half than the first half. It is, I don't know what he changes. It's the same guy. And it's still Paul George again. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's definitely got to be. And the crazy thing, Ty Lue had trouble getting another coaching job after the Cavs right. because they thought it was LeBron. They tur- teams turned him down the year before, and that's almost why they let Doc Rivers linger. They didn't think Ty Lue was ready. They made him an assistant coach last year, even after winning a title, obviously. He's not, he's he, not gonna have he's not gonna have LeBron <laughs> get a job uh, anymore. That, no, that, no, and they need to make sure he keeps it and doesn't yeah, need a exactly. job. Exactly. 
Yeah, they need to make sure they keep him there because if that goes awry and Balmer doesn't doesn't show him he loves him, somebody else will pick him up in 25 seconds. That'll do it for this show. We will see if we talk to you at some point this week with that WPIL player playing in an NBA Finals game. And we will also see what the ratings are going to be for that NBA Finals. We know what they've been to this point, even in the Pittsburgh market. But if you get a WPIL player in the NBA Finals, even if it's late at night for Phoenix, I hope, and we will see if Pittsburgh watches, even though Pittsburgh's not necessarily an NBA town, even though I think it's a little bit more closet sometimes than people would like to admit, maybe myself included, but we will see if Pittsburgh watches Cam Johnson. Also a quasi-pit product, of course, even though he's announced and by rights as a North Carolina player. Mike Fakovic and Mike Ossie, that'll do it for this edition of the show. Hit that subscribe button. It's free to do so. And also head over to Pittsburgh Sports Now and all of our other sites. For all our co-